I'm just going to uh, join in with my prayer now. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, that we can be here this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help me to, to deliver what you want to say to the people here this morning. Lord, I pray that your spirit would take uh, what the scriptures call the foolishness of preaching. And that, Lord, you would take it, you would make it something uh, just of you, Lord, just something of God. Lord, I pray you would take my words and the things that I have studied and, and have meditated upon this week. And I pray, Lord, your spirit would take that and just apply it to each heart here. I pray, Lord, you would encourage, edify, challenge, change us, Lord till we conform to the likeness of Jesus Christ, that we might have the mind of Christ, Lord. Change us, Lord. Let us be your people, people who walk in the way that Jesus walked, Lord, that we might be lights amidst this uh, corrupt and perverse generation, Lord, that we might be uh, lights reflecting the glory of God, uh, Lord, that we might be seen in the darkness, Lord. I just pray that you would change us through your word and instruct us, help us to grow in faith and understanding and love. In Jesus' name. Okay, so um, last week we began a sort of a, uh, I guess you'd call it a series of sermons um, where we were, I think the phrase I used was, what preachers say. I was talking about, you know, words that preachers use, phrases they use, nothing really theologically complex, just kind of things that preachers say. And maybe you've heard it and you think, well, I think, kind of think I know what he means by that, but you're not quite sure. So it just began like that, really. And we talked last week about the flesh, what the preachers mean when they say, oh, well, it's the flesh. And, and so we, we talked about that, and you can access that, by the way, online, our, our YouTube channel, you can watch that whole sermon again. And today what I thought I'd uh, talk about um, is this, worldliness. What is worldliness? Anyone heard that? You must have heard that phrase. You know, when I, when I was preparing this, and I thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, this is what I'll talk on, and I thought, you know, I can't even remember the last time I heard a sermon on worldliness, being worldly. Maybe I should have called the series things that preachers used to say, but I don't think it's a good sign, you know, because the Bible does talk about worldliness. What, what do we mean by that? Worldliness is, is the state or the condition of, of being, I guess you'd say, worldly. That's the, the, the word that the Bible tends to use. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard, I'll come down here a minute, you know, I've heard preachers say, um, Oh, you've got to be careful of worldly music. Worldly music. Or, or, well, they're worldly clothes. Or, um, or, well, you don't want to watch that because that's a worldly movie. Ooh, it, am I getting a bit near the knuckle with some people? Or, do you know, there was a time, obviously a very long time ago, when I was accused of coveting a, quote, worldly Haircut. So I'll, I'll leave that image with you in your mind. You can decide yourself what that might have looked like. But is this something that we need to be concerned about? Should we be worrying about this? Or is it just a concern of, you know, some kind of suit-wearing fundamentalist Baptist church in America? They're really, you know, upset about it. Should we care about it? Is it something that we should be thinking about? Do you know, I think that it is perhaps, I would say the single most but one of the most important things facing Christians today in the UK in 2015, I think it's of absolutely the utmost importance to understand what does the Bible mean when it says worldly. So we'll come to a term that, that you'll probably have come across in the scriptures and that is the term the world. The world. What, what does the Bible mean when it says the world? Well, um, it means, it can mean one of at least three things. Now, if you're into studying the Bible and you're into going into the Greek and all this sort of thing, you, you will find that in your Greek lexicon, 
it, it will probably say cosmos, world cosmos. And it's the same word it will use in every time, but just be aware, the meaning of the word can change depending on the context. We have this a lot, context, who's speaking, who are they speaking to, what are they talking about, Put all that into the mix, as they say, and, and, and you'll, you'll come up with the, interpretate, the correct interpretation of the word. So what does the phrase, the world, mean? Well, it can mean the earth, this physical, created earth. John 13, 1, I'll throw in the, the Bible references for you. It can mean those people, sort of corporately, if you like, those people that are without Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Or it can mean the values, the customs, and, and the practices of the unsaved, uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 16. So that's really the last one is really what we're going to be looking at today. The values, the customs, the way people think, the things they do, those people who are without Christ, who are not trying to follow Jesus, but they're just kind of, if you like, living their own life in their own way. When we talk about the world, we're talking about that system those system of values. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? System of what, what you hold dear, how you live, what you do day to day, and so on. So this is this this is generally what we mean when we talk about worldly uh, or worldliness. It's it's if you are living in the way that uh, and those values and those practices that the world holds dear, then you are living in a way that is inappropriate for a Christian. And we'll see that as we go through and start bringing some scriptures in, you'll see that. Now, what's wrong with, with the way that people live in the world, those who, who don't have Christ? Well, uh, lots of them uh, commit sin. I guess that would be the obvious thing to say. But then some people live in a way that's not outwardly, doesn't appear to be sinful. You know, the nice middle class man who, who, who's not a Christian, uh, you know, he's not a wife beater, he doesn't abuse, abuse his children, he loves his children. What's wrong with the way in which he's living? Well, uh, I, I look at it this way. You know, I think that the, the world, this worldly system, is not just something that is, you know, inappropriate or, or a little bit incompatible with being a Christian, this, this worldly system actually is, has a powerful, potent force all of its own. Now what do I mean by that? If you've ever taken drugs, and frankly some of us have, if you've ever taken drugs, and, and particularly addictive drugs, you start off by, you take something because you like it, right? You, you, you try it and you like it. But then it goes from liking it to wanting it. Then we go from wanting it to needing it. And before you know it, instead of you being in control of that drug, it starts to control you. And I believe it's the same with the world and with the things of the world. That it starts off, you look at it and you think, well, I like that. Then you can move from liking it to, to wanting it. But then you can move from wanting it to needing it. It becomes like uh, an, a drug, like an, an addictive drug. How can that be? How can just you know, physical, temporal things have that sort of power over a person? That really is what we're talking about, the world. We're talking about things that, you know, things I like to touch, I like to smell, I like, you know, just those physical, creative things. How can that become addictive? How can that affect me in such a powerful way, well because there is somebody who is manipulating that, that system, those values, those beliefs, those customs, there is a person behind it who is actually using it and using it against you as a Christian. Now you might not have thought about it this way, but you, know, you might find this shocking, but the Bible reveals that actually that person is the devil, is Satan. Uh, and not only is he the manipulator of this world, not only is he the one who's using it to fight against you, just like remember last week we talked about how he uses your flesh to get you away from God. In the same way, he is manipulating the world, but it goes beyond that. The Bible says he is the God, small g, the God of this world. 
and that he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Isn't that amazing? He's actually blind. They can't see. They can't see the truth. They think this is all good stuff, but actually don't realize that the devil is taking those worldly things and using them to entrap people, to draw them away from God, to keep them away from God. And it's the same with Christians. He still uses this world like he used our flesh to draw us away from the things of God. So that worldly things are not just, oh yeah, it's just kind of by accident or they're just kind of indifferent things. There is a power, a spiritual power, that's working behind them, using them to make you fall, to draw you away from the Lord. Well, let's go to the scriptures and see what um, they have to say. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly, there's the word, lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So living now, at this time, in 2015, Bible is saying what? In fact, it, it says grace teaches us, doesn't it? You know, a lot of people don't realise that. The grace of God is teaching you something and it's to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, those worldly desires. So let, let, let's start to define what we mean by, by worldly living. What is the opposite of worldly living and how do we, how do we you know, say this is worldly living? You know? um, so using the text that we looked at in Titus there, worldly living is unsober living. Yes, it's a real word, unsober. Uh, unsober living is, if you like, living excessively, living immoderately. It can also mean not being serious about the things of God, being, being flippant about you know, important, eternal uh, things, being, being, if you like, frivolous living. When we think about people getting drunk, what's the opposite of drunk, sober? We think someone getting drunk, they're out of control, they're just doing what they want. Uh, um, you know, and, and the, the opposite of that is being in control. You know, we're, we're not at the subject of anything. Uh, you know, we're using our will to follow God. It's it, sober living is what we require. The opposite of that is on sober living. It is unrighteous living. Worldly living is unrighteous living. Not living right. Not walking in obedience to the commandments of Christ. That's what Titus was saying, isn't it? That we need to live soberly and righteously. When? When we get to heaven? No, in this present world. Now, right now. So it's, it's uh, worldly living is unrighteous living. Not living right. Not walking in obedience to the commandments of Christ. Unholy, unjust. I'm sorry if this sounds, sounds negative. I've kind of put it in a negative sense just so you can see what it is not. Then we'll, we'll look further what it is. So bear with me. Uh, yeah, so, so it, it, it is definitely not unrighteous living. Uh, it, worldly living is ungodly living. In other words, living wickedly, living irreverently, living in a way that in every sense and in every practice is the opposite of God, is the opposite of how Jesus walked. Jesus is the epitome, isn't he, of godliness. You know, how, how, if you want to look at, if you want to say, well, what is godliness? Look at the life of Jesus. Look at how he lived. Look at how he treated people. Look at the kindness that he showed, the humility that he showed, uh, uh, the, the, the obedience to his father that he showed. All that is godly living. The opposite of that is ungodly living. So, these, these words, these phrases, really ought to get us asking questions about our own lives. You know, if we're, if we're going to take these scriptures and going to mean anything, we have to apply them to ourselves first of all, don't we? And kind of put our own life under the microscope and think, right, so, so how am I living? How am I uh, uh, walking in my walk with God? Um, what do we believe? What values do we hold? How 
do we live? Do, the, do we hold values that are different to the world? Do we hold values that are not informed by the word, but rather informed by God and by his word? Just, just I'm not asking you, but I want you to ask yourself, is that how many, do I hold values that are different to the world? What about, what about how we speak? Do we speak like the world, or do we speak uh, more in common with, with what God's word is teaching us to speak like? How do we dress? What do we eat? Who do we see? What do we watch? What do we listen to? Now, you might be thinking, come on, Paul. God's not interested in all that. He's interested in my heart. He's interested in what I believe. All the rest of it, it doesn't really matter. You know, it, 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 and you know, we want to reach the young people, so we've got to relate to them, and we've got to, you know, all, all this kind of stuff about worldliness and that. You know, it belongs to a bygone age. It's, it's nothing to do with what God wants from me now in 2015. Well, let, let's see what the scriptures say. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to follow me. Colossians chapter 3. You have to support whatever you say with the scripture. Otherwise, it just it's your opinion. It's something you like or don't like, therefore we have to go to the scriptures, and that's what I want to do with you this morning. Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Notice that, whatsoever ye do in word, it's coming out of your mouth, and indeed, the actions that you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, do it all as if you're doing it to God. Do it in the name of Jesus Christ, as if there is no conflict between what you say, what you do, and what Jesus would do, and what Jesus would say. You used to have those wristbands, I don't remember those. Are they still, are they still people have got them, you know, to say, what would Jesus do? Have you seen that? So, so... Yeah, that's what this is saying, isn't it? Whatever you do, what you say, what you do, do it as if that's what Jesus would do. Have a look at 1 Corinthians a second. Just turn there. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 31. Verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Wow, that's covered a few bases, hasn't it? Whatsoever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, and then, and then he just puts that in the end, doesn't he? You like that, it just covers everything then. So whatsoever you do, do it to the glory of God. Is God only interested in what, what's in my heart? Is he only interested in what's going on internally? Is he only interested in what I do on a Sunday? No, he's interested in what I say, what I do, whatsoever. Everything, every single part of my life, God's interested in that. And he wants me to do it to the glory of God. Everything, whatsoever you do. Now, does he really mean that? What I eat, what I drink. So let's think about that in practical terms. Can I, can I go for a walk out in the beautiful countryside to the glory of God? Yeah, actually, I think you can. I think you can. In fact, some of my most wonderful times that I've spent in prayer have been just out walking amongst the beauty of God's creation. To clean summer, you know, we go up to Lime Park, you know, at Lime Park there. And we were walking through there, and, and you know, the bees and all the kind of crickets and stuff were making this noise, chirping and stuff, and you can just hear all this buzzing around all the, the flowers around you and stuff, and you think, wow, God has, has created, He's made all this, and it causes praise to rise from your heart. You know, if you felt like that, but it's how it gets me, you know, or you just get right up to a really big hill and just look up or look out around you and think, God's made. So yes, I think you can do that to the glory of God. 
Can you play with your children? You've got a little child there. Can you play with your child to the glory of God? Yeah, I think you can. When you look at that child, you look at how innocent they are, how God has made them just so beautifully. And, and you have that interaction, particularly if you're, you're a parent and you're, you're, or a grandparent, with that little child, that joy that you, you, you get from them. Can you do that? Yes, you can, to the glory of God. Can you eat? Can you drink to the glory of God? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm not, not everybody does it these days, but we sit down to a meal. We thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this food. We're thankful that we have food to eat. So even just in basic, everyday things, we can thank the Lord and we can do all, can't we, to the glory of God. It's just a way of how you think about what you're doing in your life. We just don't always think about it. Quite often we're so busy that we don't, we're not thinking actually about what we're doing. We can do it to the glory of God. We can do all things to the glory of God. Can you get drunk to the glory of God? I, I think you'd struggle with that, wouldn't you? You can't, you, can't, you can't get drunk to the glory of God. You, you know, can, you, can you cheat on your husband to the glory of God? Can you belittle your wife to the glory of God? Can you, can you slander and malign a brother and sister in Christ to the glory of God? No. But see, we don't think about that too much. You know? I, I, you know, I, I hold my hand. I, I don't think about everything I do. Sometimes it's out my mouth, and I think, oh, that, that shouldn't have come out. It's even worse when you, you've got a microphone, you know, and it's recorded. You've got to think about what, what I'm saying, what's coming out of my mouth. These are really important things. So we've got to think about what we're doing, you know, to, is it, am I doing it to the glory of God? Can I be rude, deceitful? Dishonest to the glory of God. Oh. All right. So there are. So God's not just concerned about what's in here. He's concerned because because you know out of the heart the mouth speaks, doesn't it? Yes. What's in here actually comes out of me. It comes out in my actions. It comes out my value system. What I believe is important will actually eventually come out in how I live my life. That's why some, some preacher said, the end of all doctrine is practice. Because whatever I believe about this book, about the Bible, will be how I, I'll live my life according to that. You know, if I don't hold this in very high esteem, if I'm more concerned about what other people think of me, then I, that, I'm going to live like that. I'm not going to live like this book is telling me to live. I have to value this. And have to think, well, I want to deal honestly with what the scriptures say. And I want to live in the way the scriptures tell me to, to live. See, worldly people live in a way that does not consider the glory of God. Now, if you want to define how they live, that's it, isn't it? They live in a way that does not consider the glory of God. Let's bring in another scripture. 1 John 2, 15-17 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So three things John mentions there. The lust of the eyes. What does that mean? Lust in, in, in the Bible is talking about a desire. The lust of the eye. Got to have that car. Got to have those shoes. Oh, got to have that phone. You know, I told you how it's like a drug. It's addictive. Starts off, I like it. Like becomes want, want becomes I need. If, you, if you're submitting to that worldly lust of the eye, you become covetous. Got to have this, got to have that, or I'm just not happy. Comes a drug to you. Lust of the flesh. Got to have that woman, got to have that man. Whatever it is that is feeding your, your senses, and it can be anything, it can be food, uh, um, 
It can be those extra four hours in bed that I don't really need. You know? I, I just, my, my flesh likes it. Did that last week, didn't I? My flesh likes it. I just sit here. The third one was the pride of life. Got to be told I'm the best. Got to be told I'm the best at my job. You know? Got to be told, got to be thanked for everything that I do. I've got to be told that I'm better, smarter, funnier, prettier than who? Than you. And the next person feeds my pride. I'm better than you. I'm higher than you. I know more than you. I'm cleverer than you. That's of the world. That's not what the Bible teaches Christians, is it? We're taught to be humble. We're taught to think of others as better than ourselves. We're taught to come alongside uh, those who are in need and help them. You know? So this pride, the, this way of thinking about ourselves and thinking about others is, is worldly. It's worldliness. To be, uh, uh, you, know, a pr- you know, pride is a, is a really wicked thing. Pride is so subtle because it's just so socially acceptable, isn't it? If you've got a problem like drug addiction or, 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 or alcoholism or, you know, something that's really kind of obvious or, or even if you're struggling with things like anorexia or whatever, it becomes obvious. People can see that. But pride is something you can keep hidden, isn't it? Pride is respectable in some ways. But, you know, pride is pride's the sin of the devil. You know? I'll be like the Most High. That, that this is pride is such a, 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 a demonic thing. The Bible says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. So to be worldly is to have one's mind fixated on temporal, temporal things. To be absorbed, to be, to be entertained by them. And to want them and to need them around you. It's got to be entertained by them. If I come to church, it's got to be entertaining. You know, you have people come and like sort of, you know, I, I mean, you go into church service and you sort of sit down like, all right, come on, show me what you've got. What, you know, no, we're meeting together. We're brothers and sisters meeting together with the living God. You know, it's a, this is a, a, a corporate congregational thing. I'm just doing the, bringing the gift that God's given me. You should be bringing your gift as well so we build one another up. It's not like they are, uh, uh, you know, audience and entertainer. No, it's not about that at all. John Wesley said, leisure and I have parted company. We will never meet again. That's a bit challenging, isn't it? But what was he saying? He's saying, I'm done with the world. I'm done with all that. I'm following God now. I've got something something more important to do with my life. Keep your entertainment. Keep your leisure, keep your pleasure. I've got something more important to do with my life. Okay, so that's it. Is it all no fun? Yeah? Is that it? Is the end of it all, all enjoyment for me? I have to live like a Puritan doer, totally, you know, uh, uh, no laughing, no smiling. No. That's not what the Bible says. First Thessalonians 5, 16 says. Rejoice evermore. The Christian has not entertainment of the world now, but joy. Joy exploding in his heart. But his enjoyment is not from the things of the world. His enjoyment is now from God. He takes his enjoyment from being with the Lord and from doing the Lord's work. Going out there, you know, if you're a Christian and you've taken the gospel out, maybe you spend a bit of time with somebody just telling them about Jesus and you come away from that. Do you know there is such a high sometimes from that using? That was so brilliant. You know, that was just wonderful. Just doing that with that person, seeing them start to understand who Jesus is, that's how we, where we should be getting our pleasure from. If you're a parent here today, please encourage your children to take their enjoyment from the things of God. Not from the things of the world. So easy, isn't it? To, to get our enjoyment from, you know, and the, and the world's ramming all this entertainment down your throat. Oh, but the world isn't a person, is it? The world's not a person. There's a person behind it. He's the one who's shoving it in your face saying, look at this. Look how this is. Look how this is attractive. 
You'd like this in your house, wouldn't you? Who's doing the pushing? Who's, who's dangling this stuff in front of you? The devil. <laughs> Now, you know, when you become a Christian, maybe you thought, you thought originally, well, yeah, I, I, I'd like to go to a church maybe, meet some people, and uh, that would be quite nice, and maybe something, you know, to do on the weekend. Ooh, well, you picked the wrong religion, I'm afraid. Um, you see, Christianity is a radical, revolutionary religion. It is in the business of completely changing people's lives. It's radical. I'm going to use a word that people, uh, 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 it's in the newspapers all the time now today. It's extremist. Did you know that Christianity is extremist? Not in a violent way. Not in the sense of, you know, indoctrinating, brainwashing people. It's extreme love in action, isn't it? <coughs> when Jesus said, love your enemies, whoa, that's extreme, isn't it? You know? When he says, bless those who are, is it, uh, despitefully use you. Wow, that's extreme, isn't it? That's radical. That's revolutionary. People don't generally think like that. Somebody doesn't like you. Somebody's your enemy. You might want to get them back. Or you might want to have nothing to do with them ever again. But Jesus says, no, express the love of God to them. Love them. Help them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Oh, well, they're not Christians. Yeah? Pray they find salvation. Do you pray for the Muslim guy down the road? Has a little corner shop there. Do you pray that his children will be healthy and happy? That he will find Christ? You know? That he'll have a really good relationship with his wife? Or, or, or are you thinking, oh, it all goes wrong for him? Oh, I hope his business fails. Oh, I hope he has a miserable time. Is, is the love of Christ within you then? Do you really love your enemy? Like Jesus said, you should. You know, it's radical, isn't it? It changes the way we think about the world. And that's what we need. We need to be changed. You and I. And I need it as much as you do yet. We need to be changed. We need to start with the Word of God. So I'll get into the Word of God, get into the Bible. It says, be radical. Read it. Believe it. I'm going to add to that. Do what it says. Do it. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Don't become a Bible expert who never lives out what it says. That's no good. This book is meant to be lived, not just read. We must separate ourselves from the world. Is there really such a thing? Worldly clothing worldly haircuts even. Well, I'm going to let you decide that one. But I would say this. Do you know, uh, it was Billy Graham who actually said in the 1960s, he came up with a phrase, you know, when the miniskirts were in and all that sort of thing, he said, miniskirts, mini morals. What did he mean? He meant the person's clothing was a reflection of of the views that they held, of the values that they held. Yeah? And, and any teenager knows that. I knew that. So I might want to dress as a teenager in a rebellious way, different to my parents, to show how I feel inside, to show that I hold different values. So what I'd say to you is whatever it is, it's what you listen to, what you watch, how you dress, ask yourself those questions. Is it inappropriate? Is it, is, does it reflect the world's values rather than the scriptures? Is it, is it, am I dressing provocatively? Am I dressing uh, androgynously? You know, or think about the values that the world has. How am I dressing? What am I watching? What am I listening to? What books am I reading? You know, um, can you do all to the glory of God? Can you watch? No, thank God I've not watched it. Can you watch? Fifty Shades of Grey to the glory of God. Uh, from what I know of it, I don't think you can. So, you know, let's separate ourselves from the world, not because we have some kind of dress code or some kind of 
type of music that the pastor says you should be listening to this, but you decide yourself, how like the world am I? How different am I in every, not just in what I do at church, but in my whole life, in everything that I do? Am I doing all to the glory of God? I'm just going to leave you with a, a quote from uh, Francis Asbury. And I like it because it's just really simple and short. He says this. And he, he said this just as he was about to go to America. If you know about Francis Asbury, he was a Methodist. Fairly young guy, I think, when he went. He went to America and he got himself a, a he made his own mission statement. You know, this is what I'm going to go to America as a missionary and do. And this is his statement. I am going to live to God and bring others so to do. I'm going to live to God and bring others so to do. In other words, I'm going to live to God, for God, according to this word. I'm going to live to the glory of God and I'm going to bring other people to do the same. Let's pray.